Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. Okay, uh, members, I'd like to welcome you to the, the weekly meeting of the uh, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee. Conscious that we're operating a new system called Starleaf. So, welcome the members who aren't physically present here and indeed anybody who's, who's watching in, uh, online. Um, okay, we are, uh, we're, we're Corrit, okay. Um, everybody seated appropriately distanced from each other. Uh, we're adhering to the, the uh, guidelines. Um, today's meeting is an oral briefing from the department on the monitoring round and a written briefing on the LCM on the medicines and uh, medical devices bill. We will also consider the allocation of the 25 million for the agri-food sector market and we'll receive further oral evidence from the department uh, on the environment bill before moving into closed session at the end of the meeting to consider um, the evidence in the context of the report. Claire, John and Patsy and Morris will be joining us via Starleaf. Very welcome. As well as the, as well as the departmental okay. officials uh, who provide an oral evidence today. Uh, members will have received written guidance on the Starleaf system on Monday. And if there's any queries, they should contact uh, Stella. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, there's, um, there's a facility on to raise your hand. And when you do this, the clerk will be made aware and will add your name to the speaking list for questions as is normal procedure. And uh, members att uh, attending in person in, in the here, obviously, don't use Starleaf. Uh, the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. And obviously, the usual rules that um, you can use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and muted. And with no apologies, uh, can refer to members of the draft minutes uh, held of the meeting on the 4th of June at pages 5 to 8. Um, can I seek agreement on those? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, okay, can I refer members to the briefing paper from the department at page 6 of the table pack? Um, and the memo from the clerk at page three of the table pack. And the clerk's brief includes some questions that members may wish to explore with the officials. So at this point, I would like to take the opportunity of welcoming Roger Downey and Linda, H Roger Downey, uh, finance director, and Linda L Lowe, the head of financial planning. And I'd like to ask uh, Roger, could he commence the briefing? Thank you, Roger. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning. Before I start uh, on June monitoring, I'd like to, to briefly refer to our 2019-20 provisional outturn, which was included in your written briefing. Uh, this was returned to DOF in mid-May and reported 99.9% on the final non-ring fenced resource tail budget of 206.2 million, 99.1% on the final ring fenced resource tail depreciation of 24.6 million and 99.2% on the final capital deal of 81.7 million. This not only achieved the business plan target of between 99 and 100% of final budgets, but al almost achieved full spend on the largest uh, non-ring fenced resource deal budget. Turning to this year, and DOF has asked for the usual information at June monitoring. Uh, starting with reduced requirements, and we have none of these on the resource side. On capital, we have undertaken a thorough review of our budgets and have identified 12.7 million reduced requirements across six projects in this monitoring round, as set out in Table 1. Uh, we have challenged business areas not to be over-optimistic and hold on to capital that has slipped or will slip due to COVID-19 in the hope that it can be spent later in the year, and so we are releasing 12.7 million now. Nevertheless, our residual capital budget of 87.4 million is still 5.7 million greater than our final budget last year of 81.7 million. Also declaring these reduced requirements now will allow the executive to reallocate the funding to larger capital departments who are better placed to use it to bolster the construction sector at this time. Regarding bids, we have no non-COVID-19 bids at June monitoring, and we also have no reclassifications or proposed reductions and reallocations. On technical issues, we have six transfers either into or out of the department. 
the largest of which is the residual 14.7 million cap pillar one replacement funding which will bring our allocation up to 293 million for this year and is the same as last year there are also some uh, net reductions of 1.5 million in EMA and 2.2 million in non-budget Turning to the COVID-19 reprioritization exercise, and you'll be aware that the executive has already allocated there over 30 million pounds against our COVID-19 bids. This includes 25 million for market interventions in the ivory food sector, 3.8 million for waste pressures in the councils, and 1.5 million to support the fishing sector. In stage one of the reprioritization exercise, DOF has asked us to realign budgets internally to meet COVID-19 pressures. As our opening budgets were only confirmed in late March, in some cases funding was only allocated for a few short weeks before we were reassessing where it could be reprioritized. The outcome of this work has led to 7.5 million being identified in table two of your written briefing to move to those areas in table three. In addition, we have submitted one residual, residual market interventions bid for the agri-food sector of 81.5 million. Further details are available in the annexes and Linda and I are happy to take any questions on any of this. Thank you, uh, Roger. Um, before I go around um, the numbers here, uh, there's a couple of questions I'd just like to draw attention to. Uh, Roger, there's a 12.7 million um, reduced requirements. Um, I, I note, for example, like in the Rural Development Programme, that's three and a half million, and the Rural Business Community Fund, one and a half. That's five million, which is quite a chunk. Uh, w w have you looked at any anticipated consequences of that um, funding being reduced? Uh Sorry, you broke up slightly there. Is that, is that on the, the FB research vessel or the Rural Development Programme? Rural Development Programme, Roger. The Rural Development Programme. Uh, well, the, the, the Rural Development Programme, uh, it's split up two, two and a half million for leader and one million for rural tourism. So, uh, yes, I suppose there is, the projects are still going ahead, um, but there is slippage of those amounts. But there are still significant amounts of uh, expenditure in those two programs this year. On leader, uh, the national element is still 8.1 million, and on rural tourism, it's still 1.2 million. Uh, and when you you add in the EU funding as well, that'll that'll increase it by uh, around a, a further third. So there's there's still significant expenditure in those programs. But yes, there is there is some slippage um, from what was originally projected. Um, before COVID-19. And do you see in the relation to the 81.5 million bid, Roger, um, I'm aware that the, a previous assessment was for 105 million. Could you explain where the 81.5 million, uh, how, how, how was that figure arrived at and how is it broken down? Well, it's, it's essentially, uh, we had a we had a bid in for 107.5 million for for dairy beef and horticulture and three and a half million was for horticulture so there was, there was 104 million then uh, for the, the two larger sectors there uh, we got 25 million for uh, the uh, was met by the executive um, where as you know we're current ministers currently looking at that to see how that that will be spent uh, so it's uh, largely a reduction from uh, the 104 down to 81, 81.5, and and that's uh, just for dairy and beef at the minute. Okay, I'll um, I'll move around here. Harry is the first person who's indicated okay. he wants to speak. Ask thank, a thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. And uh, funny, I was going to ask about the rural development program. 3.5 million does seem an awful lot to be lifted out of the program, and I would have made your concerns about. The finished article there, you know, but you've you've already answered that one a fair bit on it, so thank you. But maybe you could just give us a wee bit more on the finished um, projects as such. You know, it will really affect them, won't it? You know, there'll not be as much done. Uh, on those, uh, I suppose there there is still quite quite a significant uh, amount happening. So if there's eight point one. Uh, 8.1 million national funding with a further third brings it up to around 11 million so there's still quite a significant amount on leader that will be will be taking place this year 
um, and rural tourism, there's 1.2 uh, national, um, and when you add the EU element, that'll bring it up to about 1.6. So there's almost 13 million pounds of, of capital will, will still be taking taken place on, on leader and rural tourism. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is, and that's just those two, two parts of the RDP that are affected. Um, the EFS and uh, the FBIS are still are still going ahead as planned. There's no reductions in there. I think there's there's actually some some additional capital going in on on both those projects. That's okay. Thank you. Sorry, Roger. Just as a follow on from Harry said there, um, I, I'm correct in saying that there's 70 million pound allocated in this multi annual budget for the leader program. What will this impact on the 70 million pound actually being spent on the ground? Uh, no, that uh, it's it's just slippage. So uh, what's not spent this year can be spent next year, sure. um, and that, and that's just I suppose an assessment uh, at this stage. Uh, we'll see if there's a if there's a need for for more uh, capital later in the year. We can look at uh, reprioritizing or bidding later in the year if if demand comes in for more. But I suppose at this stage, uh, the indications are that that we can't spend it. Uh, as planned, we don't want to be over optimistic when there's other departments can maybe do more with the capital and, and bolster the the construction sector at this time. So um, we, we don't want to hold on to it uh, where there's no firm plans at the minute. Uh, okay, I'm going to turn to John Blair. Can I thank Roger and Linda as well for the information given? Um, there's been uh, discussion and some clarification offered so far on the rural development program, so I won't go there. But on the uh, issue of reduced requirements on, on capital, the standout figures from either separate to the rural development issue are, first of all, the one and a half million reduced requirement for climate change, climate research and development. I was quite surprised to see that. And given that there, there's such interest in those issues at this time, and I would have thought we would have been up on the ante, as it were, going forward and preparing to do more on that. And also, separately, the 0.7 million, still not an insignificant figure for state transformation, because as I see it, state transformation and continued work on that may well be securing further efficiencies for the future. Uh, yes, well, so starting with the, the climate change uh, one first, and uh, one, one million on ICT, and uh, that was to take forward or help to support uh, a number of, of climate change plans that were envisaged uh, back under the, the NDNA document, and when we allocated uh, our original opening budgets, um, some of that was required for additional staff to come into the department. And uh, just with the nature of things now, there's there's not going to be that, that influx of staff that was anticipated back then. Um, so the IT, uh, the climate change IT was to, was to support that. So um, whilst that's not being taken forward under a, this specific climate change ICT budget, uh, our digital services division still has um, a, a large IT budget. And if there's a need to to do some of those, some of that IT work later in the year, then um, work can be reprioritized in there. Uh, the other half million of that climate change budget was to do with uh, the collaborative all island research hub um, with the Republic of Ireland on, on research and development. And I suppose when that bid was made originally back in January, it was for, for 1.1 million and uh, between a mixture of COVID and just firming up how much will actually be spent in the year, half a million has been released. Mm-hmm. So again, uh, we didn't want to hold on to it uh, if, if we couldn't spend it. Uh, so it's been given back now. On the estates transformation side, um, I suppose that's a, a, a mixture of, we've, we have a number of large projects that we're hoping to get off the ground in the coming years on, on the Caffrey side at Greenmount and Lockery. But uh, the business cases haven't been haven't, haven't been progressed to the stage where they can actually get kicked off. So there's some slippage there. So it's not actually uh, work on the ground. I suppose it's more the preparatory work, but but there is slippage there. Just 
uh, because of, 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 of what's happened over the last number of months. But there's still 5.5 million of uh, capital work planned on estates transformation this year. Right, so right, still right. something in the mind. Thanks, Roger. Chair, can I just come back, if, if you don't mind, on the issue of the research and development around climate change? I, I understand that the COVID-19 period will have impacted massively on budget lines and profiles right across all areas. But on the issue of additional staff being made available for commitments made in New Decade, New Approach, which is a very important uh, commitment for, for many of us and, and many more out there, as it were, uh, can I ask uh, through you, Chair Roger, has that been shelved for the financial year in terms of the NDNA commitment, or can that be revisited at the next monitoring round? Uh, well, I suppose everything can be revisited at the at the next next monitoring round. Um, I suppose uh, green growth is also uh, being taken forward by the by the department and will incorporate. Uh, I suppose a number of the things that were envisaged in the in the NDNA document. I suppose there's this was just against a specific bid at a specific point in time uh, back in January. So uh, whilst there isn't a, a, a specific allocation anymore. Uh, for for this particular area, the, there will still be work going on by the existing staff in the department who are working in in these areas. But just to answer your question, we we will be re revisiting all our bids as part of the October monitoring round later in the year. Okay, thank you, Roger. Um, we move round to Patsy. Thanks very much, Chair, and thank you to to the officials for providing us with the documentation. Um, just. Couple of three things, maybe in terms of what going through the, the budgetary, the internal pressures. First of all, um, the allocation <laughs> waste management. Um, the number of things in terms like tipping on the lakes. Has there been any increase in the pressures? Because a number of us who have been during the the COVID nineteen crisis have seen what appears to be an intensification, and indeed a number of reports have been made through to the environmental crime section at the department. So. Has it been, is that, it doesn't seem on the face of it to be an awful lot of money to be allocated towards that purpose, um, given what what is just anecdotal and it's just personal experience of what has been happening. Is Do you feel that there's adequate there to deal with it? Um, the, the second thing is then, is the 3.6 million market support. Um, as you know, there's a lot of concern at the moment about um the potential for trade deals with the United States and indeed maybe other parts of the Americas, which would lead to probably uh, the perception is certainly among the farming community and consumers, uh, reduced standards and the potential for a real threat to the market locally uh, and producers locally. So um, that 3.6 million, is it being allocated to, or is the intention to allocate it to particular sectors of the uh, of the agri food market. Uh, starting with the waste question first. Uh, so all those all those bids total up to about one point two million on uh, the waste side, and that's in addition to the three point eight million that the executive allocated. So there's there's five million that's it's going to to this particular area, of which four point seven million. Is is going to the councils. So uh, our uh, officials on the on the on the waste side were liaising with the, the councils on, on what they required in terms of waste treatment and disposal costs, and also waste collection costs that increased as a result of um, needing additional staff for social distancing um, measures, extra vehicles, and transfer stations. So uh, there there was four point seven million. Uh, Bid came in from the councils. The executive agreed to meet 3.8 million of it, and uh, we've looked to reprioritise within the department to give them the balance of that. Uh, on the second question on market support, at, at 3.6 million, uh, when the minister announced the, the 25 million that the executive agreed to put to market support, um, he advised that we would be looking internally to 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 bolster that. So that's just the that's the additional amount that we've been able to to generate internally, uh, and minister will decide how that's allocated. Uh, I think in the, he said in the next few weeks, uh, okay. whenever decisions are made on the twenty five million. Okay, that's grand. Thanks very much indeed. Um, William. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in relation to reduced requirements of CTB down 2.6 million uh, of a less requirement, is that due to less testing on the ground? Uh, uh, so, sorry, which reduced requirements? Uh, TB compensation. <clears throat> TB, did I see here? TB compensation. Uh, Two point six million. No, there's there's no. We, we haven't flagged up any uh, the TB compensation. The the current projections are are in line with last year and are in line with the existing baseline. So uh, we, although it's very early in the year and things things can move. Uh, between now and I suppose particularly as we go through the winter months, but there's there's no reduced requirement uh, identified for that uh, project at this stage. Right, just just okay, that's okay. Thank you. Hey, um, Philip, uh, Kerlak, uh, just following on uh, in a similar vein to John, uh, I, I think it is disappointing that there's money going back that was uh, initially earmarked for. Uh, climate change action and prep preparation for that. I mean, obviously, it's important and quite right that we reprioritise budgets uh, in the middle of this pandemic uh, to face the action current at us. But I mean, we, we're also aware of, the, of the, the seriousness of climate change, and as John has pointed out, uh, commitments within the NDNA agreement and indeed a motion passed by the Assembly back in uh, a climate change action. So, you know, it, it, it's disappointing that uh, in Table One there's 1.5 million. Going back, that would be, uh, in my eyes, very useful for research and preparation for, for the department fulfilling its obligations. And and just then, maybe if you could clarify, the 1.5 million in Table One is different from the 1.6 million in Table Two uh, earmarked under climate change. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm hopefully right in saying that that's a total of 3.1 million that uh, within the department was earmarked for. Either planning or preparing for climate change action that is now no longer there and is going elsewhere. Uh, yes, the the uh, the one and a half million for climate change ICT and RD and R and D in Table One is on the capital side, and the one point six million for climate change in Table Two is on the resource side. So, uh, so that's. You, you, you could add those two together to get the 3.1 million altogether. Uh, on the resource side, that additional funding, um, most of that was additional funding that came in um, from the executive uh, as part of the opening budget, uh, the opening budget outcome, which happened uh, in late March. And uh, I suppose we we then started uh, looking at reprioritizing shortly after Easter. So there was only uh, a, a matter of weeks uh, that that those budgets are, were in place, so uh, there wasn't there wasn't I suppose a great deal of time given everything else that was going on to to progress those those budgets as fast as as may have been the case if if COVID hadn't happened. Um, there are still a, a a number of things that are that are still taking place in relation to the strategic environment pro programs and climate change. Uh, totaling two million, and these are due to be channeled through the uh, environment fund in five main areas: uh, biodiversity, nature recovery networks, and terrestrial surveys of, of nine hundred thousand; climate change and plastic pollution initiatives of two hundred thousand; air quality initiatives of three hundred thousand; the Northern Ireland Coastal Survey of four hundred thousand; and improving water quality of two hundred thousand. So there's there's still two two millions. Two million pounds worth um, of expenditure uh, that is being taken forward that that wasn't uh, that 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 wasn't rolled forward, and um, so that's all in addition to the 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 usual funding that that goes out in relation to the likes of of the environment fund. Just quickly, if I come back in, I mean, in terms of the resource and development and additional staff, I mean, is this the department saying it doesn't need those staff or it doesn't need them now, and we'll get the money back and and ramp up once uh, we're through coronavirus? Uh, well, uh, I suppose the uh, in terms of getting the money again, uh, the that was in our opening resource budget, so that will roll over to next year. So it's so it's in the baseline. So uh, 
that 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 funding is available uh, next year when when hopefully things are are more settled. Um, I suppose the original allocation was to to get uh, a number of staff in, and then there's there's other I suppose other priorities within the departments in terms uh, of EU exit that that need to be addressed as well, and there's difficulties getting additional staff in to support those as well. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, you know there is there is a team looking at green growth, which will be looking at, at a number of the the new environment areas. So it's uh, there's still a focus on it. Um, it's just not, I suppose, not to the same extent as as it would have been if, if things had happened under a more normal situation. Okay. Rosemary. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Roger. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at table three, the internal pressures to be addressed. The first one is the AFB COVID-19 testing, 1.3 million. How long will this go on for? I know I'm perhaps asking you how long is a piece of string, but how long have you budgeted for for this to go on for? Uh, well, that, that 1. 1. 1.3 million is for up to 1,000 tests a day for 12 weeks. So uh, I know uh, it, uh, they they have. It took, I suppose it took them a while to to ramp up to get the I suppose the the testing kits in place and get the testing done, and uh, and then it's that's that's twelve weeks at full capacity. So it'll probably stretch out longer than that because they weren't operating at full capacity from day one, and I suppose. Uh, when we go to do the October monitoring round, we'll be asking them, do they need to bolster that uh, in any way and to what extent? And if there's a pressure at that stage, it'll it'll be flagged up and we can we can incorporate into our proposals for the next monitoring round. Yeah, so you expect maybe more pressure in that area? Uh, well, uh, I suppose it, it all depends. Everything's looking more positive now than it did um, back around Easter time um, when we were approaching the peak of, of the, the current wave. We don't know if there'll be a, a second wave or, or further waves later in the year. Uh, I, I presume uh, if they happen, then there'll be a need for more testing and uh, we will be flagging that up as a pressure to us and we'll, we'll look at those proposals yeah. at that time. Okay. And the uh, the CAFRI accommodation income uh, shortfall 0.1 uh, million. Can you sort of give me a reason for that? I know you keep student. I know students stay in the CAFRI accommodation. Was that because some of the rent or has been handed back to students, as happened in Queens and some of the other universities? Has is that the reason? Yes, as, as as far as I understand, it's it's the uh, it's a shortfall in income from student accommodation. So that that income that was planned to come in because students would have been staying yeah. in uh, the residence is no longer coming in right. for the latter part of the year. Thank you, Claire. Uh, well, Claire. Thank you, Chair. Can can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Listen, just to let you know that the sound coming from the um, room 30 there is really dipping in and out and it's very hard to, to hear the speakers um, coming and going. So I just thought I'd maybe let you know that bit. Um, I'd like to come back to, and uh, thank you, Roger and Linda, for, for the information. Um, and Roger, you've outlined very, very clearly there about the budgets um, and the effects on climate change and the strategic environmental programs. But when you're saying that the green growth is still in place and still being taken forward by the department, and then you've given us a list there of the two million expenditure under the SEPs um, that are still being um, worked on. Can I ask, is, is in the budget, the, the, in the table, I think it was table one there, it says 2.3 million has been taken from strategic environmental programs. Are they any particular set programs that have been stopped or put on hold, or is it just a general sort of um, lessening of the budget for the works and the programs that you've already outlined in biodiversity and and the other works being continued? Uh, it's my understanding it's a scaling back of the program, so the, the work still uh, being taken forward. There was there was quite a, a list there of, of yeah. areas <laughs> the work still, still going on. So uh, so we're still trying to progress everything, but maybe not to the extent that was envisaged um, 
back when the, the opening budget was originally set. Right. Uh, then going forward, um, obviously COVID is the immediate emergency and rightly so, and all focus is there trying to deal with the crisis that it's bringing. Um, um, from my um, understanding, and, and I think from all the research and science out there, we know that climate change and um, everything that's going that that will bring to us in terms of stresses, emergencies, pressures, and the radical shift that would be needed to deal with that. Um, will be going on for a long, long time. Is there anything being done to try and then um, mitigate in the budgets come, going forward to make sure that that is given as much resource as we do need? Because we know that this department is going to be um, heavily impacted going forward. And there's obviously Brexit you've mentioned as well coming this year as well. So I mean, I completely understand all the pressures, but um, I, I want to be, I suppose, reassured that um that there will be the budget and the finance set aside to deal with the emergency that has started that is climate change uh well uh i suppose the the opening budget we, we the minister had made those allocations to the to the environment areas so uh in most respects that will roll forward to next year um, so, uh, although we can't spend them, or the the money's been reprioritised this year, yeah. the the opening position will will roll forward to next year. Um, and hopefully, we'll be able to take take the work forward as planned for the full year. Uh, there'll also be an opportunity as part of the budget exercise for next year to bid for for more funding. Uh, in the same way, we were able to secure additional funding for strategic environmental programs and climate change this year. Um, so we'll be making a, a strong case again for that, and uh, we'll, that'll that'll happen as we move through the the autumn, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll secure additional funding for next year as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, sir, um, Morris. Sorry, that me, chair? Yes, Morris, that's you. Can you see me all right? Yeah. 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 Uh, thanks very much for your, your, your presentation, Roger, uh, so far, and, and Linda. Uh, my, my queries are around the reduced capital requirement for the Alpe Research Vessel. Does it mean a delay in purchase, or does it mean that the, the purchase is not going to go ahead now? Uh, no, it's, it's just simply a delay. Um, so uh, the, the, the project's up and running. They're, they're going through the, the various stages of... Um, pre-procurement leading to procurement. Uh, there was 7 million identified in the original budget for this for this year. Um, but uh, as you can imagine, it's, it's quite a technical specification to, to get this right. So uh, and it's important to do the, the, you know, the, the groundwork at the early stage so that you they get what um, they need uh, whenever it's completed. So uh, 5 million has been given up uh, in this monitoring round, but there's still 2 million being taken forward. And it's uh, still still part of the project. Will 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 go ahead as planned, but just on a, a slightly longer time scale. Okay, thanks very much, Roger. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Morris. Um, before I uh, just wrap up here, um, Roger, you see, I noticed there in the um, the note that there's been 0.5 million allocated to the Harbour Authority for a shortfall. Could you have any um, details on what that short shortfall? Is any more detail on on, on that? Uh, that's that's to NIFA. Yes. Sorry, you were breaking yes. up a little there. Yes, yes, the, 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 the half, half a million income there, yeah. shortfall for NIFA. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, that's that's. Uh, we we don't normally fund them. They're they're a self funding organisation, so they rely on the receipts coming in from the vessels that, that use their their harbours, and just because uh, there wasn't the same activity, then the income isn't generated uh, but they still have their operating costs and overheads to um, you know that, that, that I suppose are fixed to a certain extent so uh, they, they made a bid to the department to for the shortfall in income in those areas and I was I was looked at uh, as as part of this monitoring round I suppose half a million is not a, a, a huge amount for uh, in, the, in the department's budget, but it's a significant amount for NIFA um, proportionally. So that's that's why uh, that funding's been allocated there. 
just find it, Roger. Last week we got a presentation from the Permanent Secretary around the pressures to do with the Brexit and the protocol. Um, has there, is there any clarity so far in terms of the, the ports? You know, um, he did say last week that there's a lot of um, good advice and words from the from the, the British government, but the checkbook hasn't been produced. Is there any any further developments around um, that aspect of the ports for the SPS checks? Uh, no, I just I know uh, there's a there's a team working on it uh, within the department, and uh, they're liaison with uh, Defra on this as well, and with DOF who are liaison with Treasury. So, uh, but uh, anything I've seen is it's still on in, in early stages, and, the, and nothing's been firmed up. But they are they are working at pace to try to try and get uh, something together fairly quickly. Okay. I think Claire has upper hand there again. Is that right, Claire? Always. Oh, you're okay. You're okay. Thank you very much. Um, Roger, can I just ask, obviously then budgets for everybody have been just reallocated and reprioritized. Uh, can I maybe get a sense from you? Do you feel that the department have been given what they feel they need in terms of dealing with COVID and then that reprioritize budgeting? Do you feel that the department will actually need to spend it all on COVID related emergency allocation? Uh, I suppose uh, we bid for more. Uh, um, we we got uh, we got what we got, but uh, I suppose the executive doesn't have a bottomless pit and there, mm. there's big pressures. Uh, you'll be well aware in the Department of Health, Department of Communities, uh, Infrastructure and Education, just to name a few of the bigger ones. So there's there's not enough to go around for everyone. So I suppose difficult decisions need to be made. And um, I think in that context, we did uh, quite well to, to get the funding uh, for the uh, agri-food sector, for waste um, and for fisheries. Uh, so uh, at the minute, uh, the uh, I think the the funding uh, funding that we've got for the, the fishing sector is already um, one and a half million over one point one million is already gone out, uh, so the, the, it's well underway. Uh, I think to one hundred and forty over one hundred and forty vessels. Um, I think I saw something on that. Uh, the minister will be making decisions shortly, or the next few weeks, on the the twenty five million. Um, the councils are already looking there their slice of the waste money so that that i think that's due to go out um and be paid by july and in terms of those internal prioritizations uh there there's nothing there that's that uh, i can see that that won't come to pass at this stage so um uh I, th I think yes that that, that, that uh, it's, it's right that we we look to reprioritize our, our funding at this stage and it looks like that those areas that are getting the funding will will spend them okay thank you thank you sir okay um as members have no uh, further question i'd like to take the opportunity to thank um roger and linda for their attendance at the meeting today via starlink thank you very much Thanks. Okay. thank you yeah. thank you Okay. Right, folks. Um, next on the agenda is a written, written briefing, uh, LCM and Medicines and Medical uh, Devices Bill. The Medicines and Medical Devices Bill is currently making its way through Westminster, and the LCM falls to the Health Committee to deal with. But Part Two deals with veterinary medicines, and this falls to us, the, this, uh, to the department, and to us, the committee. The committee, the Health Committee, has asked that. This committee, the ERA committee, responded to part two, and the deadline for this was yesterday, as the health committee will be considering this at the, the meeting this afternoon. The LCM will be debated in the chamber on the 16th of June, Tuesday, 16th of June. This first opportunity that we have had as committee to consider the provision in part two and agree our response. The memo from the clerk is page 11 to 14 in your packs, contains the issues and members may wish to consider. Members need to agree a position on the veterinary medical provisions and state whether or not they support it or do not support it or whether, as a committee, we do not take a position. I want to refer members to pages 11 till 41 in your packs. Uh, very, this includes a memo from the clerk, a written brief from the department, an extract from the bill, an explanatory note, a memo from the health committee, 
correspondence with the Health Minister and a copy of the bill. And there's further paper uh, tabled at page 14. Um, we have dear officials to stand by to, if I have any questions. Do I have any questions on this particular um, yeah. matter? Yes, Rosemary? Uh, yeah. I'm just wondering, um, in relation to the medicines and the medical um, legislative con consent, what is the difference? What would be the difference if this is implemented now and what has been previous? Call in. Uh, if you want to say that you want to call in Naomi, Francis, and Peter. Okay, so I'd like to call in Naomi, Francis, and Peter. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, does the chair does the chair want sort of a, a sort of a brief overview of just the context of, of the bill that might help sort of um, answer some of the questions, yeah. or are you happy just for us to go straight to questioning? I, I think I think members appreciate an overview. Is that? Yeah, that would be great. Um, so, basically, as you've, as you've indicated, Chair, the Department of Health is the lead Northern Ireland Department on this bill, so most of its provisions relate to matters that fall within the competence of the Department of Health, but our interest is in the provision that relates to veterinary medicines. Um, so, th this is a very technical and potentially complex provision, so um, I'll just say a bit of background about the bill and put it in context for you. So, um, since the UK joined the EU, um, it's been required to give effect to EU law in the UK, and this has largely been achieved um, through powers conferred by the European Communities Act 1972. Um, that act confers powers to implement EU law by making domestic regulations, and the relevant power is conferred in Section 2.2 of the 1972 Act. The power in Section 2.2 will not be available at the end of the transition period because it is to be repealed by the EU Withdrawal Act 2019. So until now, the power in Section 2.2 has been used to make changes required by EU law um, to the UK regulatory framework on veterinary and human medicines. At the end of the transition period, this power will no longer be able to be used. So the bill seeks to address this gap by introducing regulation making powers. So effectively, it's, it's what you would call an enabling bill. It doesn't actually do anything itself, but it enables legislation to be made that you know that, that may you know um, provide for matters to be. So it allows for changes to be made to the existing legislation by means of secondary legislation, so regulations, and it therefore avoids the need for primary legislation. So it avoids the need for um, acts of the assembly to be made. Um, its purpose is therefore to allow the law to be easily updated at the end of the transition period. Um, although there are powers in the EU Withdrawal Act um, 2019 which allow us to make regulations to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol, they're not specific and we consider, the Department considers, that we need the powers in the Bill to amend the law and keep up to date going forward. So part two of the bill, that's clauses eight to 11, provide a power to amend or supplement the veterinary medicine regulations 2013. And that, that, is, that is the domestic UK wide legislation that currently implements EU law on veterinary medicines. Um, so the bill provides the power to amend the 2013 regulations to deal with matters such as the authorization, manufacture, import or distribution of veterinary medicines. In terms of who can exercise the powers, the bill allows the department to make regulations alone and it also allows the department with the DEFRA minister to make regulations jointly. In either case, the bill provides that the regulations that are made have to be subject to the scrutiny of the Northern Ireland Assembly and in most cases, the regulations will be subject to the draft affirmative procedure, which, as you know, is a very high level of scrutiny. And in all cases, the committee would have its place and role in scrutinising the legislation. The bill sets out the factors that need to be considered before regulations can be made. And those are namely that the, the safety of the veterinary medicines, the availability, the attractiveness of the relevant part of the UK as a place which to develop or supply the veterinary medicine, and before the regulations can be made, there has to be consultation with relevant persons. Um, so the only exception to that consultation requirement is where there would be an urgency to make the regulations in order to alleviate the threat of serious harm to the public. 
there is a provision in the bill and we've drawn the committee's attention to it in, um, in its written briefing and that's in clause 9 2. Um, this provides a power for the department or the UK minister to make regulations which correspond or are similar to two new EU regulations, one on veterinary medicines and the other on the manufacture and marketing of medicated feed. So the committee may have some questions about this power, you know, given that the Northern Ireland Protocol provides that easy EU regulations will automatically apply to Northern Ireland. Um, but I hope that we can provide some assurance to the committee on that. This power is unnecessary for Northern Ireland because of the protocol. Um, it can't be exercised as long as the protocol is in place. And it effectively is, a, is, is what you would call a dormant power. So although it is unfortunate that it extends to Northern Ireland, it doesn't present a risk to the protocol. And it's really just a, like a technical anomaly. anomaly. Why, why is the, the is legislative consent motion needed? Well, basically it's needed because the bill deals with the transferred matter or transferred matters related to human and veterinary medicines. I should say that veterinary medicines in Northern Ireland is devolved. It's not devolved in any other area of the UK. Um, and as you know, um, the history of the legislative consent motion is that the Dallow wrote to the committee on the 25th of February to inform you of the, you know, the Minister for Health's intention to lay the consent motion. And on the 1st of April, uh, the Minister Swan sought the approval of the executive ministers to the motion. Um, and that was agreed by the executive on the 22nd of April. The Department of Health then proceeded to lay its memorandum on the matter on the 27th of May. In terms of the current position on the bill, um, it was introduced into the House of Commons on the 13th of February. It passed its second reading on the 2nd of March and has been referred to a public bill committee for consideration. At this stage, it's anticipated that a report stage in the bill may be the 18th of June or that week commencing the 18th of June. And the motion on the legislative consent needs to be passed by the Assembly before then. Um, and a debate has been scheduled on the matter for the 16th of of June. Um, so really, that's what I have to say just in terms of um, introduction, Chair. Okay. Okay. Um, we have Rose, Rosemary. Yeah. Uh -huh. So basically, thank you very much for your no presentation. Problem. Thank you. Um, so basically, we can assume that the similar powers and regulations that are contained within the EU are going to be are going to come into regulatory powers domestic powers here in Northern Ireland? I think, I think what it does, um, Rosemary, is that it, it provides a power um, to, to to do anything that would have previously been provided by the European Communities Act. Um, so in the case of the UK, you know, the, the DEFRA minister may exercise that in a particular way going forward. It may, you know, to implement sort of UK domestic policy on veterinary medicines going forward. And, and, from our perspective, you know, we will have an obligation, obviously, to align with EU law on veterinary medicines, and that would affect how the power could be exercised here. Okay, right. Okay, that's clearer. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Okay, um, Patrick. Yeah, thanks very much indeed, Chair. Um, it's just uh, getting into the, maybe the specifics of the legislation there, particularly Part Two. Um, that's it. It's Part Two Two. Um, in reference to making the regulations under subsection 1, just like a wee bit of clarity around it. Part A there refers to, which is grand, the safety of veterinary medicines in relation to animals, humans and the environment. Um, B refers to the availability of veterinary medicines. Um, I'm not quite sure how you make regulations on veterinary medicines that aren't available, or maybe you do, or maybe you could expand on that. But the third bit puzzles me a bit, and um, that's C which refers to the attractiveness of the relevant part of the United Kingdom as a place in which to develop or supply veterinary medicines. I really don't know what that's about at all. Um, it sounds a wee bit uh, unusual to me anyway, um, but maybe maybe you could expand on that for me, please, just that particular um, uh, I suppose, part two. Mr. McGowan, 
might think I'm maybe on it, and, and perhaps Peter, I have uh, met my colleagues here on the line who are familiar with you know, how the current sort of procedure for authorization works, but it could yeah. be perhaps that you know going forward, given that the UK is going to be part of the EU system for veterinary medicines, that there may be considerations um, at play as to whether that gives Northern Ireland access to that EU market that may not be uh, that, that may not be available to other parts of the UK. So I think that is what it means when it talks about the relevant part of the UK, that, that I think is defined in the legislation. So effectively what they're saying, what, what it means there is the attractiveness of GB or Northern Ireland as a place in which to develop the veterinary medicines. Well, wonder why it doesn't say that then. It's, but what, think, what, what, it's the relevance of the, the, the word attractiveness. I, I'm not quite sure what context or how that um, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it just sprung out of the page at me whenever I was reading it there uh, earlier. Um, Peter, is that something that you might be able to lend some advice on? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Can yeah. you hear me all right? Hi, Patsy. Yeah. No, I don't, I, no good man. <laughs> no, I don't know what that means, to be quite honest with you, what, what that word I mean, I was going to, what that's trying to convey. I don't know. Uh -huh. Maybe Chair, it would be, it was just as I read it, it sprang out of the page at me. Maybe we could get a wee bit of clarity on that um, as to what, what it's supposed to mean or what, how it's supposed to be interpreted. I'm sure it's in there for a reason, it's just it doesn't, doesn't seem to be very apparent. That's no problem. I can, I can contact the relevant UK department and try and get that cl clarification for the committee today immediately following this hearing. Oh, that, that's grand. Thank you very much. Robin Potsay, there. Um, I'm just wondering, um, Naomi, you've pointed out the clause 9.92, um, and just referring to that then as a dormant power. So I'm wondering, um, is it, it, have you any concerns about that being extended to Northern Ireland? Um, and I, I'm sort of curious, I suppose, if it was removed um, due to Northern Ireland having the overriding protocol power, uh, would that have any impact or make any difference at all? Okay. Um what I would say is our preference it would be that that power wouldn't be included. Um, you know, it's not ideal. It's unfortunate that it's there. We have liaised extensively with the UK government to potentially have an amendment made to it that would remove it. Um, unfortunately, that, that that hasn't that hasn't happened. And I suppose. Um, our view on it is that we can live with the provision because it is dormant, because it doesn't actually have an impact. Um, the only, if it was to be removed, um, the only circumstances in which I could envisage, and again, I'm not sure that it, they would be, it would be able to be exercised in these circumstances would be, but say if the protocol itself, say if the assembly decided in four years time that it was going to withdraw itself from the protocol, um, it, it potentially could be exercised then. I think even in those circumstances, it would be problematic because the what it does it is it allows the um, allows for them sort of allows the UK government and and the department to amend uh, two new EU regulations that are coming into force in 2022. Um, so by the time the assembly would have deliberated on the matter and decided perhaps to withdraw from the protocol. Um, those EU regulations would already have formed part of Northern Ireland law, so it's very it's very difficult to see circumstances in which it would be exercised. But that's the only instance in which I could see that it you know that you know I don't think it's not a power that we need there, um, and it's not a power that we wanted or you know or sought. Uh, it's really a drafting anomal anomaly. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Okay, um, so. Members, no other questions to ask here. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, Francis, Peter, and Naomi for attending um, this afternoon, uh, this morning. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, chair. Okay, now. Okay, um, okay, folks. Uh, we need to discuss uh, committee position on this. Okay, so I want to refer to you to the clerk's paper at page eleven. Okay, um, can can I seek agreement? The committee expresses. Concerned the lack of time we've had to consider the issues sort of associated with the LCM. Okay. Um, the, the, can we get an agreement that we, that we ask to be kept up to date on the intentions of the department to make re regulations jointly with the relevant minister and West UK minister? 
Okay. Most of this is technical, and I'm right yeah. saying that I think so. I think we're going to right now we'll little. Okay. Committee, can we get agreement with the committee to keep informed of any new veterinary medicines and whether there are any issues with difference in authorisation between here, the EU and the UK? And the agreement that the committee is informed of any concerns around new veterinary medicines and the protocol and of the developments in animal health framework. Okay. And can I ask the committee, committee, can I ask if the committee wishes to take a position on the LCM at page 37? Um, specifically, do you members agree that this assembly endorses the principle of the extension to Northern Ireland of the provisions within the Medicines and Medical Devices Bills introduced to Parliament on the 13th of February 2020, dealing with human medicines and veterinary medicines? Principal, are we okay there? This will go in, members, just to, just to be clear, there, there will be a debate in the Chamber on Tuesday. The committee have to produce a short report that goes to the Health Committee. The Health Committee are leading on this. Yeah. So this will be the committee position reflected. This will be a, an official committee position, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, yes. Is this Tuesday coming, is it? This Tuesday yes. coming, yeah. Uh, okay, so the clerk will draft the response this afternoon for submission to Health Committee by Friday afternoon? Yeah. Okay. Um, are members content to agree by this by correspondence, or if necessary, a Teams meeting can be arranged for 12 noon on Friday? I'll draft a report and I'll get out my correspondence and you can come back to me, or if you have any difficulties with it, then we'd need a Microsoft team. Okay. Meeting. Sure, I'll get it out. Forward. I'll get it out today, some stage, and can I have responses by 12 noon tomorrow? Yeah. Or say 11.30 tomorrow? Yeah. And then if there's any difficulties, I'll call a team meeting for 12? Yeah. Okay. 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 So the next item on our agenda, um, item uh, five, is subordinate um, legislation, Sea Fish Industry Coronavirus Fixed Cost Scheme 2020. I want to refer members to um, the memo from the clerk at page 43, a copy of the SR at page 45 to 49, and an explanatory mem memorandum at page 50 and the SL uh, in, on page 53. I want to advise members of the SR, which is to provide financial support to the sea fish um, catching sector during the COVID-19 pandemic, was discussed at last week's meeting. At that point, members noted that the examiner's statutory rules had identified a minor drafting error. The department agreed to bring an amendment to correct the drafting error. The SL1 for the amendment will be considered at the, as the next item, agenda item. Um, there were previously no issues identified with or discussed by the committee. The SR is subject to confirmatory resolution by the Assembly and come into operation on the 5th of May. Is there any comments from members? Okay. Chair, so, it's not a comment on this. Yeah. Maybe you're not at liberty to take it. I mean, have we had an update on the, the spend of the 1.5 million from the department? It's in your written briefing on right. the COVID-19. Um, let me just see. It's in your table papers because that was that was in late. I have it marked in the actual paper copy, but not here. Yeah. Okay. So if, uh, page twenty of your table papers, the very bottom, it starts there. So um, let me see here. We see where it goes. Um, yeah, letters of invitation to apply for the scheme have been issued to uh, 166 vessel owners and 81 letters of el and eligibility were issued during April. Uh, 166 letters of offer and claim forms have been issued, 155 returned to date. Payments made as of 5th of June mm -hmm. to 146 vessel owners, totalling £1,150,000. Okay. So, members are content. Can we put the question that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment, and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2020 the Sea Fish Industry Coronavirus Tax <coughs> Cost Scheme NA 2020 and recommends it be confirmed by the Assembly? Okay. Yep. Um, so, the SL1, the Sea Fish Industry um, Amendment 2020, can refer members to the correspondence in the Department at page 56 to 58 and the SR at page 59 to 60. Um, as a justified members, the purpose of the SR is to make a minor amendment, SR 2020-76, that we have just agreed to define the length overall of a fishing vessel by substituting a reference to Council Regulations EEC 2930-86 with Regulations EU 2017-1130. The amendment will not involve any impact on the administration of the scheme. Uh, members, any comments? Or any, any of that? Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so we're okay for, for to move to the next legislative stage then? Yep. Okay, um, members, I'm going to swap around items, agenda items 7 and 8. Barbara, who is in the corner here, uh, has been clerking the committee on its response to the COVID-19 funding matter, and she'll be taking over clerking that part of the meeting. Okay, um, so uh, item seven is the departmental briefing, uh, COVID update. Uh, the written briefing is at page 16 of the table papers. Um, if members have any questions on the update, can they forward them to the clerk by close of play today? And can I seek agreement to publish the update on the committee's webpage and issue a tweet in relation to publication? Okay. Okay, Barbara will clerk the remainder of the meeting and um, just give a couple of minutes for to uh, re relocate. Yeah, we need to clean the seats and wipe everything down, so let's do that. Somebody's coming up to change this over, are they? Yeah. Okay, I'll just let them know now. Um. There we go. I don't want to pull that out until they come up and do it, so I'll just leave that there for two minutes until they come up and change that over. That there sort of controls that, so. Okay, so consideration of the allocation of the £25 million COVID funding for agri-foods, sector market intervention, the draft letter to the Minister on page 62 to 64, um, and can members take a couple of moments to read that there and indicate if you have any comments? Where's that again, sorry? It's 62 to 64. Um, yeah, thank, you. You. thank you, Charlie. Right. Not paying attention.
Okay. Remember, okay, that letter tells you the answer. I think it reflects the discussion that we had. Okay. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. You're taking the environment bill as well, then? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so thank you, folks. Uh, that'll issue to the Minister. So, number nine on the next item on the agenda is the um, UK Government Environment Bill. Uh, further or oral evidence from uh, DERA. I want to refer our uh, members to a memo from the clerk at page 67 to 70. The draft report is 71 to 115, and the LCM at 160 to 120. There's further, further correspondence from the Department of Page 30, the table papers, which advises that the Minister wishes the LCN to be considered for a debate on the 30th of June, subject to agreement by the Business Committee. Uh, members will recall, on the 28th of May, the ERA Committee began its consideration of evidence and key issues of the LCM on the Environment Bill. The, a number of important issues in relation to the bill that merit further discussion with DERA officials were identified. Members will ask to consider these uh, issues as outlined. In addition to any other concerns they might have, and to explore these further with department officials. As of the Agriculture Bill, the department received a copy of the paper, Consideration of Evidence and Key Issues, for a factual check. The potential committee recommendations were withheld from the department. Can I welcome via Starleaf uh, John Mills, um, John Mills, Director of Environment Policy Division, Carl Beatty, uh, environment uh, bill team. Can I invite John Carroll to make some uh, opening remarks and then we'll have some members' uh, questions. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Thank you, John. Uh, hope you can hear me. Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, we'll, we'll try to address any further concerns that the um, committee has on the bill. Apologies if we have to come back in writing on some points. Usual in the report uh, on the bill through the through the difficult current circumstances, uh, and if content chair, I'll just give a, a brief update on the bill's progress uh, since we last briefed the committee on the 27th of February. Um, we've been providing updates through the weekly uh, briefing in the interim. <clears throat> uh, remains our as soon as we can and before the bill leaves the Commons in, in Westminster. <clears throat> While it's technically possible to, uh, to grant uh, consent at a later stage, uh, the UK government is keen to have confirmation of our intentions on the bill. Uh, committee stage at Westminster commenced on the 10th of March and was suspended on the 19th of March due to the COVID crisis, uh, by which time about 100 amendments had been tabled. During the suspension, most of the debt DEFRA staff who'd been working on the bill were redeployed um, mostly for the COVID crisis. Uh, and locally, we've uh, not been able to fill our vacancies on the, on the bill team. So there has been some impact there. It was widely expected that the committee stage would not resume until after summer recess, but it's now considered likely that it may uh, recommence later this month, possibly even uh, concluding before the summer recess on the uh, 21st of July. Uh, the legislative consent motion uh, was laid in the Assembly on the 19th of March. In the normal run of things, the, the consent motion would have been tabled in, in early May. However, in current circumstances, we've worked with the uh, committee clerk and her staff uh, to try and come up with a, a workable timetable. We're grateful for that engagement. Uh, and the debate on the motion has now been provisionally shed Is a list of date before the assembly. Excuse me, John. Uh, we're just finally we're grateful for the committee for sight of the draft paper, as you mentioned, Chair, uh, um, for the purposes of fact checking, and we'll get back on that uh, uh, as soon as we're able, if we haven't already done so. Thank you. I think that's me. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, do members have any questions? Philip. John, thank you. Uh, just, I mean, in terms of 
Uh, and it's an issue that we've raised before, the, the, the concern that, and I think it's been specifically uh, expressed by the committee, but I know it's been expressed by environmental groups and others about the failure to have non-regression, a non-regression clause within the bill. And, and I'm just looking at notes here, uh, and the department is arguing that there's any potential for non or for regression uh, with regard to current protections that we would have whenever this bill uh, takes that. And I think the words are uh, as the department have used as far as possible. So that would lead me to be concerned that there is the potential for non-regression. I mean, uh, I certainly think it's the view of this committee and, and as I said, environmental groups that uh, we don't want to see any regression from current laws. In fact, we'd like to see a stronger protection, which is why they're, they're, within the agreement we've got a call for uh, an independent uh, environmental protection agency for the north and climate change protocols and stuff like that. So just, I mean, I'd like to expand your thoughts on the potential uh, within this uh, bill for regression from current uh, environmental protection in the north. Well, I, I, I think um, I would just make a few high-level points and then, Carl, if you want to uh, uh, contribute with, with any... Uh, think you've got to add. Um, there's, first of all, there's, would, there's nothing in the bill which um, which which would um, which would be a threat to uh, um, uh, current to environmental uh, protections. Um, there is uh, uh, there's no uh, what it does is is in fact uh, re-state uh, or bring some of those protections into domestic uh, law in terms of environmental governance and oversight and principles. Um, the, uh, the Withdrawal um, Act um, uh, uh, that passed uh, in, in Westminster uh, Carl, can you pick up anything there? Because we're losing John. Yeah, sorry, I've, I've lost him as well. Um, Stay, yeah. Oh, he's back. Um, yeah, maybe I just sort of fill in here. I, I think um, what's important here is that you know we need to draw a distinction between um, environmental governance arrangements and environmental protection. Um, certainly, government governance arrangements will change as a result of this. But um, you know, environmental protection itself, there, there is nothing in the bill, as John says, that that threatens um, environmental protection. Um, you know, existing measures, you know, the, the 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 measures that we have now will will still be there after this bill is uh, in place. Um, in terms of non-regression, the UK government decided not to um, include a non-regression clause, um, as as is their right. Um, and, um, and and I'm you know, pretty sure that they have no intention of changing that uh, that position. Um, I believe colleagues in uh, Scotland and Wales are considering introducing uh, non-regression clauses in their devolved legislation, um, and obviously that will be open to the assembly to do the same um, in, in the future. Um, I think. You know the, the the strong sense we get from DEFRA is that you know whether the UK government is not uh, prepared to put a non-regression clause in the uh, in the bill. Um, at the same time, they don't have any intention of um, reducing environmental protections, and um, and and and, um, and neither do we. Okay, okay. okay I'm going to ask John Blair to come in. Thank you, Chair. Can I, can I thank uh, John and Carl for, for what they've given us so far? Philip has addressed uh, head-on an issue that, that I had on a, a short list here, so I'll refer to, to, to my other issues. The first of all, first one is, um, whilst I totally understand that this is something thrust upon us from another place and it has to be dealt with, and it will go through its uh, timetable there, whatever we think, C can I ask... Firstly, why there isn't more reference to these governance arrangements by the department for, for this reason. There is, whatever's happening at Westminster, a Northern Ireland commitment 
to an independent environmental protection agency for this jurisdiction. Therefore, is it not reasonable to try and match our commitment uh, on that in, in the medium term to what's in the bill in the immediate term? And preparations for that should have perhaps been flagged up or a timetable for the preparations and the timings of those in the report and the briefing. And I hope John and Carl understand my reasons for saying that because fundamental to governance of these matters going forward will be that independent environmental protection agency and how that sits with the measures that are in this bill. The second one is the, uh, around the issue on pollution. It's very well for the, the uh, bill to make reference to making the polluter pay uh, and, and all of these sentiments, but in reality, there is no um, negation for polluters um, to, to rectify what went wrong. And should we not also be f fleshing out, as it were, more detail on how we're going to do that? Thank you. Carter John? Okay, I, I, I seem to have lost connection there, but hopefully I'm back again now. Um, well, on the, on the independent agency, I mean, ultimately what we were trying to do in the bill was to um, make sure there wasn't a governance gap uh, for the uh, for when uh, the the UK left um, the EU. So that meant preserving, in governance terms, the uh, the environmental principles that were enshrined in the Treaty on the Functioning of the, the uh, European Union and the uh, Commission and European Court of Justice oversight. So to, to give that if you like, independent um, environmental oversight. And so as the bill was constructed, um, we, we were not uh, trying to or, or weren't putting in um, provisions for um, uh, an independent environment agency, uh, i.e. to make the uh, current um, Northern Ireland Environment Agency uh, in legally independent of, of DERO. Um, so that's why that, that didn't go in. Um, now, the, the, the new uh, Decade New Approach uh, document um, has, has given a commitment to um, look at um, establishing an environment agency in terms of future plans, uh, and the ministers... Uh, 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 for the bill not something we would be able to get in um, and, and the, the establishment of that would, would uh, require um, uh, an assessment of costs and, and uh, economic appraisal before we would uh, before the minister would want to undertake that I don't know if you've got anything to add to that Carl on on that point uh, no I mean I think that uh, you know sums it up pretty well I mean the the, the um, you know, the, the development of, a, of an independent environmental protection agency for Northern Ireland is, you know, is a, a, a significant undertaking um, in terms of the, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the policy development, the economic appraisal, uh, the development of legislation, um, and you know that, that for, for that to happen, Northern Ireland primary legislation is required. Um, so there's the, you know, the whole process, the, the, the time that it would take to do that. As well, so you know, this is not something that can happen overnight. Um, and as John says, you know, our our, um, our aim with uh, the, the the provisions in, in this bill are to uh, plug those governance gaps that are that are that are going to um, arise at the end of the transition period. And if I can come back on on the on the pollution question, um, I mean, I I I, I understand uh, the point. Uh, uh, Mr. Blair, that uh, you know, we can do all the legislation we we we, we like. If, if um, the, you know, it won't necessarily uh, operationally stop um, people uh, polluting. But I mean, in terms of what the the bill does, it it one of the principles that it preserves from the European uh, Union is that the polluter pays. So at, at that level, at least that principle is is being preserved. Um, in terms of um, in terms of making the polluter pay, there are various provisions 
throughout legislation to um, for uh, for criminal uh, action against uh, people and for um, making people restore um, uh, damage or have the department res uh, fix or other authorities fix damage which that the the polluter can then be um, charged for uh, and there'd be there'd be far too many to go into here um, in terms of other provisions in the bill th this does give us um, new uh, or revised powers on producer responsibility which will go um, much further in making um, the producers of things like packaging, which could become a problem, uh, bear uh, uh, the costs, the entire costs of dealing with those things. So the bill in those other provisions does strengthen that. Okay. 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 John? John? Yeah. Claire? Claire? Can you get in there? Thank you, Chair. Um, and Thank you so far for this. I mean, I completely understand what you're saying about, you know, this being an enabling bill and that there's governance versus protection issues. Um, so there's environmental governance versus environmental protection. Um, and going back again, I just want to put on record that the fact that there is no non-regression clause in there, to me, feels like... Um, a threat to protection, and particularly when you put it in line with the, the, the principles set out to guide the, the, the bill going forward as well. And I'm wondering if you've got any thoughts on how those principles could potentially um, open. Uh, do you think that they're solid enough to guarantee environmental protection, or is there something there that needs to be tightened up in order to, to do that? Um, and also, then, how does the, the bill fit with protocol and the commitments within there as well? Um, so, you know, what kind of preparations then have the, have the department and yourselves has maybe been involved with within the department? Um, what's been done to make sure that we have compliance with environmental aspects of the protocol with this? And will the bill be crossed? cutting in its application so will it apply to all executive departments um that's another thing that i would like to to know because we know that northern ireland isn't working so the department minister are not working on um and have no plans for a standalone environment bill in northern ireland um and the minister himself has stated that he believes that existing environmental legislation um provision is a sound basis for environmental protections in Northern Ireland, but you just have to marry that with our environmental track record. Um, and just, I think that there's a raft of questions then have to be asked about that there. So that's just kind of an overview of where my head's at with it, but I would really appreciate your thoughts on that um, and where we stand in Northern Ireland. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Um I'm tempted to say that well, that was that's more than enough questions that then then I think I, I can uh, cope with at one go um, on the cro the cross cutting I think is is uh, uh, can be dealt with the 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 bill is cross cutting it was uh, the agreement to uh, proceed to legislative consent was agreed by the executive um, and it will the, the provisions will affect uh, other uh, departments. Um, the um, the Office of Environmental Protection, um, one of its functions will be to um, ensure compliance by public authorities with um, or to oversee such compliance with environmental laws. Uh, so uh, it will uh, therefore extend to, uh, to 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 all departments. Um, uh, on the, on, on, on what it, what a scope will be will will be to um, to will cover environmental laws and uh, that includes um, uh, environmental protection of the of the of the natural uh, environment so it, its scope will be if a department is involved in, in any any doing environmental things it will be caught by by the OEP um, on the uh, the protocol, um, yeah, I, I, I did note in the um, 
the um, in 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 the uh, in the, the committee's report. I mean, concerns about the. Um, the, the, the impact on the protocol or, or possible impact on, on the Northern Ireland Protocol, but I, I, I'm not sure what, what the specific concern is. At the end of the day, the bill um, uh, brings into domestic law things that were, that we had for 40 years under the EU, like environmental principles um, and uh, environmental over, independent environmental oversight. So in that sense, it makes it, it makes, uh, it will make Northern Ireland more like uh, the previous EU regime. Um, and uh, it will not, in, uh, it's hard to see how it will, will have an impact on or make more difficult uh, the, uh, the implementation of the protocol. Uh, there, there, are, there are a limited um, number of environmental um, regulations in the uh, Annex 2 to the, to the protocol um, and some important um, areas that I think if you looked at it from an environmental perspective would, would not be covered by the protocol um, uh, such as water um, and aspects of habitats, air um, and a lot of the wider um, legislation like what framework directives, whereas the protocol tends to be about very specific um, objectives, uh, 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 EU regulations like batteries or, um, or packaging. Uh, and the emphasis there will be on really the integrity of the single market from the EU's point of view. So I, I, I don't see that there's, there's necessarily a clash or, or an overlap between what's been done here. <laughs> Um, the first question, Carl, did you pick up on? I think that was about pr uh, protections. And, uh, uh, the, uh, oh, yes, the principles. principles. Would you like to pick that up? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, you know, the, the, the question was, you know, do we think that the, 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 the principles, uh, the, the, the provisions on principles will be strong enough? Um, mm. For Northern Ireland, uh, to, to some extent, I think that's probably up to us. Um, because the, um, the the provisions in the uh, in, in the bill are for us to uh, prepare a policy statement on on environmental principles, um, and you know that being a statement explaining how the environmental principles should be interpreted and proportionately applied. So you know there's a, there's a fair bit of latitude there for uh, for us for the executive because it, it will certainly be a cross cutting matter uh, to to determine what should be in that statement. Um, now we, we are working with our um, with the UK government and, and DA colleagues on a, a sort of a, a fairly common approach <laughs> to, uh, to, to to how to how this will be done, but it is still uh, you know within the gift of the uh, local devolved institutions to to decide what is in that um, policy statement. And do you know have? Is there a planned statement to, to come out on that one, or is that something for further down the line? I mean, I th just think that when you leave something as important as those principles, so if you're putting this big bill together, you're framing it within these sets of principles, those principles then are open to interpretation. And we've just seen in the recent scandal how, you know, interpretation can lead to very different actions from some people. So th that's where my real concern is. Uh, no, well, at, at, at this stage, the, you know, the work that's been done between the, the, the various administrations is, is to uh, sort of um, have a um, sort of a, a joint purpose, if you like, in, in terms of that you know that everyone is going to be doing this, mm -hmm. um, and that's the detail simply hasn't been worked out in, in any of the, the jurisdictions yet. Um, you know, resources are, are a little bit thin on the ground, obviously, and with COVID, it's, it's, it's slowed things down. There's no question about that, but, um, but that will be, uh, you know, certainly in the autumn, the work will be uh, ramping up on that. Okay, thank you. Um, before I move on here to Philip, see in relation to um, clauses uh, 47, 48, producer responsibility, Carter, John, um, the issue of uh, waste has become particularly uh, pronounced now during the, the COVID pandemic, particularly as communities go out to reclaim ownership of their road and gather and engage in litter picking campaigns and many other issues. And of course, there's, there's also there's been serious issues uh, connected with fly tipping during the, the pandemic <coughs> as well. Has the has department explored 
uh, a situation whereby levies or charges could be designed in a way that could, could contribute towards effective uh, waste reduction? Uh, well, the, the, I mean, these, um, these provisions um, are about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, making, putting the, uh, the cost uh, making sure that the, the cost of, um, of of dealing with uh, the things that are caught by producer responsibility um, um, uh, be be paid by the producers of the so the producers of the packaging will ultimately um, help fund the, the the costs of of collecting and dealing with that packaging as it goes through its life cycle and ends up as litter. And, uh, and so that will help support uh, councils in, in their, the costs uh, that they um, incur in dealing with, with packaging. So that very much um, supports the, the direction um, you're, you're, you're going with that chair. And uh, there are also provisions uh, for uh, charging for um, uh, for making specific levies on um, uh, single-use plastic items in the bill, um, and um, and go on, on that. If we go back to the the original um, proposal on uh, carrier bags, of course, that the levy on that, which is about uh, off the top of my head, four or five uh, million. Uh, some of that some of that income is used to support uh, environmental uh, uh, projects uh, including uh, littering campaigns oh, thank you John that's, that's exactly what I, what I was thinking about a, a version of the carrier bag levy um, you know, within the producer responsibility to go towards environmental projects and upkeep uh, Philip uh, thanks chair. Just kind of following on from, from the vein that you, you were talking about there, Chair, I mean, I, I'm wondering with regard to clauses 51 and 52 within the bill, if the department has uh, completed any research into what uh, a deposit uh, and return scheme might look like here in the north, and with regard to clause 52, the charges on single-use plastics, I mean, I'm wondering what the department's view on the EU single-use of uh, plastics directive and is that the kind of principles and values and legislation that we should have here in the north coming out of the bill? Um, on clause uh, 51, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, um, there was a consultation uh, on, on uh, a three-part consultation on, on um, uh, producer responsibility, deposit and return, and uh, plastic tax, uh, which is which is an accepted matter, um, uh, last year, and uh, there are there's a lot now. There's a lot of detail in the, in 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 that, and that um, work is uh, still being progressed on all those matters through uh, various working groups. But uh, there is a working group with uh, other devolved administrations and um, and DEFRA on uh, producer responsibility and deposit schemes. Um, and that's uh, meeting regularly at the, at the moment with a view to consulting further on, um, on, on uh, DRS, as we short, call it for short, and on producer responsibility. And that's ex the DRS is expected to be, uh, off the top of my head, December uh, this year. Uh, on a second round of consultation um, and uh, dealing with issues, sort of the, the sort of issues that are coming up on DRS would be what um, what you would cover. Would it just be plastic? Would it be other materials, uh, uh, drinks containers? Um, uh, how will you deal with the, um, uh, the, the what type of technology would you use for, for returning the bottles? Would you have vending machines and so on? Um, and would you would you try to um, capture um, all drinks containers or, or just those that that are sort of picked up on the go, as, as it says in, in as you'd refer to in, in things like uh, cups and so on for, for beverages. So uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues in, in there, 
uh, but, but a forthcoming consultation planned on uh, clause 52. Uh, yeah, there is uh, the, um, the uh, EU um, uh, single-use plastics uh, directive um, or uh, directives to, to deal with single-use plastic items. Um, that's uh, due to be transposed by the middle of next year, I think. So it is not something at the moment that the, the, the UK government would be obliged to implement. Um, but there are aspects to that that, um, that, that um, would be uh, relevant uh, here, such as uh, um, banning uh, plastic uh, items, uh, single-use plastic items like cotton buds and so on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Am I right in saying then that the bottom line in all this is that the Environment Bill has been put in place to ensure that we have environmental protection in place when we leave Europe, and it's up to each individual administration to add to that if they wish, in relation to the North, if, there, for instance, some members have concerns about an independent uh, environment agency and all the rest, but that's up to each individual administration to do that, isn't that right? Uh, that's correct, yeah. That's, that's what I understood, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, John and Carl for your uh, attendance uh, here today. So, thank you very much. Okay, okay. thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Chair. No problem. Um, I want to advise members that we'll be going to a closed session at the end of the meeting to have a discussion on the Environmental Bill and final of positions, but that's not until the end, right? So, uh, Correspondence, pages 135, 4 to 135, um, it's an index page. I uh, want to draw your attention to item 7, which is uh, pages 166 to 172, which is revised guidance by the, uh, the Chairperson's Liaison Group to all committees during the public health crisis. There's a number of principles uh, to manage the resumption of full assembly of business taking into account uh, of the easements to restrictions and wider societies introduced through the Executive Recovery Plan. Ensure the Assembly can continue to conduct business, including exercising a scrutiny role on the COVID and wider issues, and to reduce the risk to members and staff, including by taking account of the return to work measures set out the Executive Recovery Plan. Uh, committee members are asked to adopt these principles when managing our own business. Uh, we should note that while committees can still meet to carry out essential business, there are still restrictions in place on where we can meet and for how long. Meetings are encouraged to be as short as possible and for no more than two hours. The Senate, rooms, uh, Senate and Rooms 29 and 30, where we are today, are to be utilised for meetings on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And the Starleaf um, teleconferencing uh, is encouraged to invite members and witnesses having to attend in person. There's no expectation that this committee will meet over the summer recess period. However, should an urgent issue present itself, I will discuss this with the clerk and arrangements can be made to facilitate a meeting if it is considered appropriate. Um, are members content with the principles and arrangements as outlined? Are we content to action the correspondence, uh, the action the correspondence received as suggested in the index page? Yep. Okay, the forward work programme, pages 176 to 178. Are we content with the forward work programme and to publish this on the web page? <coughs> Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And um, do members have any other um, business they want to raise? Sure. I've my, had my hand up there. Oh, sorry, um, John. And I realise it's a bit late because I was reading through the report again. Um, on the issue of the committee meetings and business practice, I have lagged up before and I, I, I want to record when meetings are held in the uh, Senate chamber, there is an issue with um, uh, members being unable to hear some of the evidence given on some of the other speakers and amplification for that Senate chamber, whether it's this committee or any other committee, but this committee's, this committee's our concern. Amplification in that chamber needs to be looked at as a matter of urgency. Thank you, John, that's noted, and we'll forward it on appropriately. Thank okay. you. Folks, I will shortly move into closed session concerning the oral evidence given in the day's environment bill. So don't, uh, don't be all leaving. <laughs> So the time of the next meeting, uh, next meeting will be on Thursday, 18th of June, via, via the Microsoft Teams. Okay. So folks, we're going to move now to closed session.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is